Hi, my name is John Kulik, and I'm here to present a unified field theory called a multidimensional geometric expansion of space-time. Now, one characteristic of a unified, unified field theory is that all the relationships of nature should conform to a kind of specific geometry. And from this geometry, we should see the relationships we see, for example, in quantum mechanics and gravity. Now, to do this, there are basically five premises to the model. The first premise is that space or space-time, since time is a part of the fabric of, of space, is actually a structure. And this is probably best illustrated, for example, in the following diagram with a bar magnet with a piece of paper over top of it in which metal filings have been spread across. This drawing is courtesy of Wikipedia. Here we can see that matter is conforming to fields, to a field effect that's imposed in space. Between the, the field structure of space and the field structure of the matter itself, there's an interaction and they conform one to another. The, and the, now the structure with it around this is not at all evident at all until the, use of the metal filings have been distributed. This structure exists in space and is imposed in space. It actually takes energy to create it in space but it's only revealed when we see how matter reacts with this field structure in space and time. Another example we see in gravity. And I'll start off with this little spinning, this little weight on the end of a string. When an object is in motion in a confined in an orbit, there is tension. So within this string, there is tension as the mass goes orbiting around let's, uh, my, my finger. Well, similarly, there is when the moon is orbiting the earth, or around each other actually, there's a tremendous amount of force required to keep these two objects, the moon and the earth, bound together. But where is that string? Well, it's the field structure of space that matter and the structure of, of space itself are conforming to that keeps these in orbit. So the first premise is that space actually has structure. The second premise is that the expansion of space does not stop at the boundary of gravitationally bound galaxies, which is the present, I would call, limited expansion model. But instead, the expansion actually occurs incrementally within the atom itself. And as a volume of space-time integrates itself on the existing structure of reality, there's a localized disturbance. In fact, this is the relationship that causes the, what we would associate as the uncertainty principle. You cannot really define where the boundary or velocity of an object is because expansion is occurring within the atom, causing a difficulty in, let's say, in measurement. But it changes, in a way, the fundamentally how we consider the uncertainty principle because instead of an uncertainty principle, what we're seeing is an opportunity principle because this expansion of space allows change to occur. If it wasn't for this opportunity of expansion, there would, be, there would be no change. Everything would stay the same. In fact, one way to look at it is to imagine, for example, a snowflake. This is why I call it a snowflake universe, because there's such parallels to it. If we take a snowflake and imagine it growing, well, change occurs on the boundary upon the existing structure. Similarly, it's proposed that expansion occurs actually within, the, within, uh, within us and around, right within us right now is this expansion occurring and it allows the opportunity for change to occur. So in a way, the edge of space is not some far off distant back in time. What we're looking back in time is the existing structure, like the existing structure we see in the snowflake. Where the edge of space is is where we are right now and that's where the change is occurring. The third premise of the model is this expansion occurs to a very kind of specific geometry. If we take a volume of space, it's proposed that this volume varies to the square of the absolute time elapsed. What that means, if we imagine a volume of space and we were to double the age of the universe, the volume would increase four times. A very simplistic geometry. Double the age, the volume increases four times. Of any of myself, since I'm a part of that space, of all objects within it, and space itself. Now, one consequence 
of this expansion is that gravity should be a function of time. Now the following over here you can see this is a relationship that defines how the effect of gravity should vary over the course of time. Now the reason this varies over the course of time is that in the past objects would be denser. And if they're denser the effect of gravity would be greater. For example if I took the earth and I were to compress it, to, or imagine it denser when it was one half its present diameter. Well, if you were walking on the surface, the effect of gravity would be four times greater. So, effect of gravity is a function of time and is greater in the past. Now, Paul Dirac, who won the Nobel Prize in Physics for his prediction of the existence of antimatter, but also believed that effect of gravity varied over cosmological periods of time and was greater. He never derived a viable model, I believe I have. Now, having gravity vary over the course of time affects a tremendous number of relationships. One in particular is the evolution of stars and how, star, how bright stars are. And one consequence of this is that when you go through the relationships, you no longer need dark energy. Dark energy is this after the fact, after the fact assumption used to, court, to, to explain why it appears that galaxies are further away than they should based on their luminosity. Now, if you allow gravity to vary over time, Cepheid variable stars, which are one of our first rungs in, our, in, the, in what we use to determine distance based on brightness, because when we look at Cepheid variable stars, the period we assume defines their intrinsic absolute brightness. And then, once we know that, if we look at some other far-off Cepheid variable star in another galaxy and we observe the period, we, would, we, th we believe or thought we knew what its absolute brightness was. Well, if that relationship gets thrown off because gravity is more powerful than the past, it throws that whole series of calculations in our cosmic distance ladder relationships. And when you make the corrections for the effect of gravity being more powerful than the past, there is no necessity for dark energy. Cepheid variable stars are more influenced by the relationship than our type 1a supernovas. So, um, the, uh, let's see, the fourth uh, premise of the model is that expansion comes at a cost. And the relationships that define the expansion of space also define the behavior of matter within this space. For example, let's say we take a look at a balloon and there are molecules moving around expressing a temperature. And if we were to take the balloon and could re decrease the tension of the balloon so the balloon would expand, there would be a temperature drop in the balloon and a corresponding loss of kinetic energy of the molecules within the balloon. Similarly, if space is expanding and things ha and objects have motion, they also experience a kinematic loss of velocity. Expansion comes at a cost. And the relationship that defines the expansion of space also defines the relationships we observe of how matter responds, of how, they, how, how, how it responds to while it's moving through this expanding space-time field. Now, uh, one result of this, once you impose this requirement, the fundamental, some of the most fundamental relationships of nature are conforming to a structure imposed in space. For example, the inverse square laws such as associated between gravity. If you double the distance, the effect of gravity is reduced by a quarter. If you have two objects of, of charge, the, the force of attraction or repulsion varies the inverse square of the distance. Same thing with electro electrostatic and magnetic relationships. These kinds of relationships are predicted as a result of uh, the fourth, re fourth assumption premise. Um, the last premise of the model is that our universe is in motion along an unobserved dimension. Okay, just as we can imagine an, a flatland universe, okay, and everybody lives in a flatland universe, we can imagine this universe moving along an unobserved vertical dimension. 
Well, let's propose that our universe itself is within an unobserved space, and it is in motion. For example, let's say we have a glass of water, and we were to drop one drop of ink into the water, and the ink molecules would disperse themselves evenly within the water. Now, the ink molecules would represent our observable space, what we can see, and the water would represent our unobserved space. Now, all we do is we now impose the requirement that our observable space is in motion along an unobserved dimension. Now, since we're also expanding while we're in motion, that means we are constantly changing direction, which introduces a kind of intrinsic centrifugal force that resists the expansion of space. For example, let's say I am in a car and I'm moving along in a direction and I turn the wheel to change the direction of motion. Well, in response to that change in my direction, there's an acceleration experienced. Similarly, if we're in motion along an unobserved dimension, which intrinsically everyone else would experience, and we were also expanding, there will be resistance to that. And this is when you, when you consider this and you go through the model, the relationship, this, the acceleration experience should be somewhat conformant, expected to be conformant to this relationship here. Well, this predicted intrinsic resistance to expansion is very close to the expansion requirement that you need to explain dark matter. So this model does not need dark energy, nor does it need dark matter to explain the relationships that we see in galaxies and as we've, as we've observed them in the past. Now, now, dark matter was initially proposed to exist because it appeared that galaxies were rotating too fast to be bound together. Okay, for example, if we were to plot the velocity of each one of our planets going around our sun, as we keep going out further and further and further, the velocity was less and less and less. Kind of follows a graph that kind of diminishes and slows down. Or right, I guess I should do it like this. So get farther away from the sun, the velocity gets lower and lower and lower, it falls this nice curve. Well, when we do this, the velocity with, that we expect to see with galaxies, instead they go, whoa, and they're flat. Instead of getting much, much slower, they seem to be constant or relatively constant, more or less kind of following a curve. So the uh, so in order to explain this, what was proposed, some kind of force has to be keeping these galaxies bound together. So the logical conclusion that was assumed was there has to be additional mass within this the galaxies that we can't see. And this additional mass is what's keeping these galaxies together. Well, under this model, this velocity along the unobserved dimension and this intrinsic resistance to the expansion of space exactly corresponds to, or very closely corresponds to, what you need to explain dark matter. Now, the following illustrations uh, kind of exemplify the differentiation of the prose model from the existing models.